Hi, welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Mario Tanyas. Today we have two guests. We have Shelley Newhart and William Dolphin, co-authors of the book, The Medicalization of Marijuana. Thanks for being on the show. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Uh, you guys are authors of a new book, and you also are here in Denver. You attended a conference recently. And so as we get into your work and we get into the book, tell us about how the conference presentation went. Um, and then of course, first start with a little bit of background. I got my degree here in Colorado from uh, CU Boulder uh, in the sociology department and this work grew out of my dissertation work in sociology. Um, so it is focused on Colorado medical patients who were 30 and older and all of the interviews came from um, the entire state of Colorado. Um, that's where the data was collected and then uh, we updated that and uh, along with my husband and co-author, William Dolphin, we turned that into a, a book. Excellent. That was just put out by Routledge. It just came out in September. My background uh, is working with patients and uh, starting way back in 2001, 2002, uh, Americans for Safe Access got started out of uh, a unfortunate problem with the federal government coming in and trying to shut down what the city of Oakland was up to. And I started writing uh, for them uh, about what was happening with the law and the policy stuff. So it's been a great collaboration working with Michelle on this because you know she had the great research with patients and I had 17 years of talking to them, interviewing them, and looking at the, the law and policy around it. That's great. And you guys, what's nice is you're a team. And so if I understand it right, you did the dissertation, mm -hmm. which was the same topic. Like, is this your dissertation and you were able to work with it, your... It's the data. It's the same data from my dissertation. And it was revised from dissertation version to book version and updated substantially from that. Um, but we were collaborators way before we were married. We been collaborating for 17 years, but we've only been married for a few years. So. Got it. Um, yeah, and yeah. what I found when I looked at the research that she did and the data that she gathered, that it dovetailed with my understanding anecdotally from patients. And I think part of what's important about this is that we have all kinds of anecdotal stories about what the patient experience is like, but hard to generalize from that, right? And this was a systematic, qualitative study that gives us more of a basis for saying this really is how it works for folks who are trying to use this medically. That's great. And so I was able to just look through the first chapter mm -hmm. in what for me is sort of the soul of the um, the book or the, the range of stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us about, um, number one, how did you figure out which stories to start with? Because you lead off with two separate stories. So tell us about those stories. How did you select those to begin the book? Well, um, in the data collection itself, we were seeking the widest range of experiences in the program. And um, when I first started, I did not have an age range on it, but I quickly decided I was interested in um, Generation X and Baby Boomer generations um, and their experiences in the system. And that was partly who was volunteering for the study, but I did have some people volunteer who were y younger. Uh, than that age range and I just felt like um, there were things I wanted to say about the importance of age in the experience of using cannabis medically that it made sense pretty early on to um, restrict the ages and just think about older adults who are using cannabis medically and um, and so uh, you know, we were using the idea of theoretical saturation, where you go out, you try to recruit as much diverse uh, members of the population that you're seeking as possible. And then um, when you quit getting new stories from people about their experiences, when the stories are kind of all falling within a pattern, um, you stop collecting <laughs> data. And so it went through some iterative um, versions of kind of and in between checking in with people in roles that interacted with lots of patients saying here's the range I'm getting are you hearing anything else that I'm kind of missing here so um, that was a sort of a check and balance on on the data collection and um, one of the things that jumped out to me and I was represented in that story of Karen and Dale was that um, patients were coming to this um, with hesitations about 
cannabis as a medical, um, as a medicine. Mm -hmm. And, but they were different. So, um, you know, Karen's concerns included the concerns with propriety. Her, she was like a PTA mom, you know, like, cons uh, you know, had raised her kids to be drug free, participated a lot in her church, you know, she, she had all these concerns about propriety around it and whether that made her a bad person. I mean, you know, we've got Jeff Sessions saying, you know, no good people use marijuana. Mm -hmm. and she, here's this person very concerned with stereotyping. And at the other end of the spectrum, you had people like Dale, who's like, Dale's a juvenile delinquent now in his 50s, you know, and had drugs were a common feature of his entire adult life. He was not concerned about propriety around drug use, but he still didn't believe it was medicine. And he had stood in a field as the supervisor over workers saying as much, uh, just you know, a year before. It was all a ruse, you know, and um, came around to believe that it had medical properties. And so these were kind of two different things that people really struggled with around um, coming around to uh, medical cannabis use. And that was uh, part of the choice of using those two stories. I think Absolutely. part of what we can see in common, though, and it's a central part of what we talk about in the book, is that there is a, you know, if you will, single story about cannabis use in America, and it's about it being for intoxication only, it's criminal and it's deviant. And both of their concerns, I mean, may have come from different life experiences, but both reflected that kind of classification. So in the case of the drug user Dale, you know, he's like, well, it's just like all these other drugs. And likewise with, you know, the, the, the Karen mm -hmm. yeah. uh, story. So um, very different people, but both subject to this kind of stereotyping of what it means to use cannabis and what the drug itself is. So um, let me ask you, William, as you went through the process of assembling all the data and getting it ready for publishing, was there one story that stuck out to you that Arthur. really resonated? <laughs> and I know, there's, I know there's many, but like, what would be one that either uh, complicated things or maybe was yeah, consistent? Arthur. 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 Yeah. Arthur okay. yeah, so Arthur, uh, so one of the chapters we deal with uh, people medicalizing in their own personal use a variety of substances. So the question was, you know, have you used other non-pharmaceutical substances in a therapeutic way or an attempted therapeutic way and we of well course actually it didn't even ask that it that in that sense it just asked about their other use of other things and people volunteered information mm. and one of the things that Arthur volunteered was that he had used low-dose LSD for like 20 years wow. to deal with the tr uh, post-traumatic experience after uh, as a gay man having been raped during military s service mm. um, and um, he, uh, b but you know, when somebody tells you they've been taking LSD <laughs> every day in a controlled That's dose over decades, um, you know, it's a little surprising to, to learn that. And he was no longer doing that. He had, he had decided to, to stop doing that. But that kind of thing presents a, a conundrum when you're trying to think about how to parse out your data. and. It does, but it also takes us to one of the arguments that we make, which is that what defines a medicine is more the behavior that people engage with with it than the chemical composition of any mm -hmm. particular substance. Sort of shifting attention to, yeah. to the medicine and yeah. all this stuff. How, how do you go from like a story, whether Karen, Arthur, or Dale, and then sort of extrapolate to some larger issues? Like, can you expand on the process that you took and then maybe one of the larger issues that Arthur's story uh, relates to? Well, when I was working on it as a dissertation, um, you know, I was really, part of the goal was to incorporate it into concepts from medical sociology and to think about what um, sort of the simplest question, which was, are people using marijuana like they use other medicines? And if not, then how is it different? And if so, then how is it similar? And so it really started from that question and I would say the arc of the book became about medicalization as a concept, um, which has been used for lots of different, um, usually it's for the disorder itself, mm -hmm. although um, other people have written about cannabis fitting medicalization as well as opiate use um, and um, alcoholism being treated uh, the way that it is um, was also a case of medicalization. And so it wasn't the first, you know, it wasn't an original idea, it's been out there, but, um, 
But what we argue uh, across the entire book is that um, this is a case of medicalization. Medicalization has clear phases to it through which it passes as it's moving from a deviant substance or a deviant activity to one that uh, fits within medical institutions mm -hmm. and culturally is understood to fit within medicine. Um, but this is y as yet incomplete. And not only is it incomplete, but it has and probably always will have a competing definition for its use that's not medical. So how, um, what happens in an inc incomplete medicalization? And just saying it, it's incomplete doesn't mean it's ever going to be complete either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see that it's in a phase and whether it progresses on, it's kind of looking like it might, but whether it progresses on, we, we don't know. We just know kind of where we're at right now. Talk about any of the stories or findings where people felt successful at, at providing counter stereotypes to the stigma that they face as medical patients. Well, that was Karen's story, really. Yeah, Karen was, I mean, quite brave. I mean, she pretty consciously, you know, said, we are um, marginalized in no other way except for this, which gives me a certain amount of platform to talk about this. And when <laughs> she had the DEA visit her house, or at least so she claims in her interview, that you know f uh, officials came to her home and um, um, gave her the thumbs up on what they had. They had all their documentation and paperwork, and everybody had told her, if there's no warrant, send them away, don't let them in. But they did let them in. And um, after that, they said, you look fine, but um, we're going to report this to your local uh, cop shop, you know. And um, Karen sat around and thought about that for about a day and decided, well, if they're going to tell them, then I'm just going to go to them myself. So she went to her lo local police station outed herself on this, that she had a garden in her house, that her husband and she were medical cannabis users, and offered to educate the police officers about how to manage uh, medical cannabis. So, I mean, you know, just really had a lot of bravery around how she was going to approach this. And, um, and, and that was not uncommon. You know, yeah. there was a sort of out and proud, you know, vein. To, I mean, there were certainly people who wanted to maintain their privacy, mm -hmm. you know, for very good reason. Uh, but there were many people who became, on some level, a bit evangelical about it and, and felt an obligation to go out and talk to people. And that is, you know, not just consistent with the data here, but, you know, my experience over the last many years in working with patient advocates that when folks see these near miraculous effects, you know, conditions that were not treatable with other medications and suddenly there's relief, they feel like, hey, I need to share this information because I know there are other people out there who are also waiting on this. And almost everyone in the study, it was medicine of last resort. Mm -hmm. They had exhausted right. everything else before they turned to this. What kinds of responses so far, I know the book was just um, released, but what kinds of responses have you gotten so far that maybe has surprised you or mm -hmm. maybe just made you think differently about what you what you did? Well, I mean, this is an academic book, right? I mean, so it's serious sociology, but we did try to make it accessible to a wider audience because it's such an important topic and policymakers need to understand better you know how this really affects people so part of what we've been surprised by though is just the diversity of folks who've expressed not just interest in it but said you know really how do I get this book you know whip out the phone and it's like let me Excellent. order that right now including a, a friend's a sister-in-law 17 year old high school student and I was like no really she's like no I looked through on Amazon they've got those previews and this is amazing I need this book and yeah. so you know it's the, been a it's the diversity been interesting. has been a bit of a surprise we weren't really sure exactly how it was going to be for the any kind of crossover market mm -hmm. outside of academia and so I'm still very curious to learn how it's going to be for the academic market and of course we won't know that for a little while yet but um, but that part has been exciting, just the enthusiasm from different corners uh, that you may not expect it. Oh, well, that's re really exciting. And it, it is, it is. Well, I think it speaks to the, the, the lack of information that's out there and people's need for something that seems at least authoritative or expert. And, you know, there's a lot of sorting out. I mean, we talked about the lateral networks. I mean, all of the patients interviewed for this knew a lot about medical cannabis and how it could be used. All of them had at least something really wrong. Right, so I mean, and that's a that's a significant issue. Definitely, and that was part of what yeah. we were talking to the doctors at that conference about was, you know, you need better communication, and the stereotype and stigma 
affects doctor-patient interactions because a lot of doctors are very judgmental and patients are aware of that, so they withhold information. Talk a bit more about um, patient-doctor interactions because one of the first things that I thought about with this book was how individuals, when they are in front of their physicians, sometimes they're either hesitant to talk about it yeah. or they find they're, they're quick to be judged because of just physicians are wired to say this stuff is, you know, bad for you and it's going to lead you down, you know, another right. avenue that's not going to be so healthy. Well, no, it plugs back into the legitimacy piece of this in, and the way that you have to kind of create legitimacy in the interactions you have as an individual, um, which is uh, also a piece of that is uncertainty. So, um, you know, whoever you're going to talk to about it, including your doctor, like you're not sure what that person thinks of this or how they're going to respond when you speak what you think about it. And so that was definitely true in the doctor-patient uh, interactions. Um, you know, um, just that uncertainty of going in and proposing it to your doctor and how they were going to respond. And so I ended up reading a lot about um, the literature on contested illnesses generally when I was looking at this. And uh, Broom and Woodward had a really good model for doctor-patient interactions that they had used when they had looked at interactions around chronic fatigue syndrome, mm. in which they found sort of three basic models of doctor-patient interaction. And um, w one of those was doctor knows best. It was your paternalistic type of doctor who thinks that if it wasn't in, you know, JAMA, then you're not gonna, <laughs> it's not legitimate information. Mm. And, um, um, then the, the middle one was called unintentional dominance, and that was more when you had doctors who were kind of uh, willing to at least informally say, it'd be uh, open-minded about it, or maybe they were even 100% like, yeah, we know that that does okay for this type of illness, but they have bureaucratic limitations often, so maybe it was their prescribing license, which is federal, and um, you know, or the particular hospital or organization that they worked for that had limitations because of ties to federal money in some way, and um, you know, that's uh, something to, you know. Their patients were um, sympathetic to that. I mean, we have patients yeah. who understood, like you know, how they were organizationally limited. Um, and it wasn't um, a failure of, of physician care that was resulting in that so much as a hurdle that everybody is facing about sort of what are the threats against me if I do this thing? Um, what are my risks? The, th and, the um, third type, constructive medicalization, is that more collaborative interaction in which the doctor really is trying to get information from the patient about what they want to do and figure out ways to help facilitate that. And you know the perhaps controversial claim that we make in here is that what gets derided as the doctor mill or the card mill doctor has really served an incredibly valuable role in moving this into medicalization because you know without those recommendations you don't have participating patients and you don't have a program. Right. So you know there are uh, obviously on the sides of the medical boards concerns about let's make sure there's an exam, there's not an underlying you know, problem that could be more directly treated with some other medication that's going to be missed by just simply, you know, kind of papering it over with a palliative answer. Um, William, let me ask you to hold the book up. Sure. So tell me about the cover. The, um, <laughs> you know, why did you select this? Because there's no doubt in with my discussions with students that, you know, they'll have a pile of pills versus some flour, you know, marijuana, and it makes perfect sense to get, you know, to wean yourself off the pill. So I presume there's some kind of subtext there. So describe the image and then the criteria, how you selected it. Well, I, we went through 20 or so <laughs> on hey, cover yeah, designs. Yeah, we had a lot of ideas for Yeah, cover. we were like, well, it shouldn't look like a grow book, you know? Yeah. And uh, so there were a lot of sort of standard cover uh, ideas that just didn't seem to make sense. And um, yeah, and something that did reflect this idea of a choice. And, you know, I mean, you might read the cover as, well, the pills have been dumped out and the cannabis has been put into the container, right? And, and that's what we see with a lot of patients, right? I mean, all the survey data indicates a substantial amount of substitution, if not, uh, you know, complete cessation of pharmaceuticals when they take on a medical cannabis regimen. Mm. And then um, looking at the population, the sample of uh, storytellers that you, you spoke with, were there any patterns like cross-culturally or was it predominantly, you know, Caucasians that you interviewed? Like any interesting patterns that stood out? 
Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I wish we would have had more diversity when it comes to that. Um, we did have a few uh, people in the study who were non-white, but it was usually um, they were white and something else. So um, the, the, the population that volunteered in the study uh, didn't include uh, a substantial number of, of people of color, um, which I, I think we do need that research as well. Um, but there were, um, there were some interesting diversities in socioeconomic status. Um, I would say um, there was a lean toward people who were at the bottom of the socioeconomic um, scale, but um, there were also, uh, you know, retired lawyers and, you know, uh, some, some people who, were, who had spent most of their life in a middle to higher income bracket who interviewed in the study and I mean there's there was just something going around um, in the news that 42% uh, of people who end up with cancer end up in personal bankruptcy wow. um, Within and two years. yeah and uh, so you know even if you start out okay if you have significant health um, issues arise it can be a huge uh, you know, hugely taxing <laughs> on that economic status and be something that has a, um, you know, a circular <laughs> down, down, downward spiral in terms of how that works out. And uh, some, some of the people in the study also had been on disability for a number of years. And so that certainly had to do with where they were on uh, the socioeconomic spectrum was just that spiral. Well, I appreciate those comments. I mean, there's no doubt, d no doubt about the diversity. It's sort of also reflective of, of Colorado, and That's right. it's really yeah. like you have to make a conscious effort and work doubly hard to ensure that you have you know different um, persons of color in a study. Two final questions because we're running out of time. Uh, brief, briefly describe the methods that you use to collect the data, and then what's the next project you have mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, the methods were qualitative. Um, it was in-depth, semi-structured interviews. We ended up having uh, 40 uh, interviews of patients, and those were supplemented with about eight or 10 unstructured interviews with people who had held different roles. They might have been a government official, they may have been a dispensary owner or worker, uh, including medical doctors. And a lot of that was um, unstructured because things were changing so fast that to figure out what was happening in different pieces of this whole thing, the only way was to talk to somebody who actually was subject to the rules that had, were changing or in process. and. Um, so, uh, and also observation over two years, uh, went to tons of advocacy related um, events. And, um, y you know, the, the intro talks a little bit about that of like, where are the patients? Because those events turned out to be mostly about a, an industry Celebration emerging of the, yeah, right. than about um, patients uh, per se, even though a lot of people in the room may have been both things. Uh, this, the content of those um, events were, were largely industry-based. Uh, the, the population, the, the patient study, did match up with the range of conditions uh, that are in the state, so, you know, sort of proportionally, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what they qualified under in terms of their medical condition and geographically and by gender. It reflected the composition of uh, you know, the registered patients in Colorado at the time. Of the Excellent, study. and I definitely have to ask you before you go, uh, before we end the episode, so you have this focus on Colorado, and mm -hmm. it seems like from what I hear, many states are looking to Colorado because of how we unrolled the legislation. So what would you say are the things that are working well, not so well in terms of the model we have here in terms of medical cannabis and, and patients right. and advice you'd have for others who are thinking of yeah. just, you know. Well, the biggest thing is you can't say adult use solves the medical problem. You know, I mean, yeah. if you are someone who needs legitimacy around your use, participating in an adult use market does not get you that, right? A lot of these people are very self-conscious about, I am not one of those people, right? I don't want you to group me with stoner culture or whatever you want to call it. You know, they want to see themselves as who they are, who are simply using this as a medicine. And if you don't allow for that kind of legitimacy in terms of, uh, you know, getting it through a kind of medical portal or gateway of some sort, then there's going to be a whole lot of folks who just simply are not going to access it. 
Um, and yeah. we've seen that in a number of states. And I wouldn't already. want to overstate that. I mean, there were also people who quote code switched quite quite readily between a medical and a and a social use um, language or uh, discussion about their use. Um, and we're comfortable with that. But I think, uh, you know, medical matters for so many reasons. We spend the middle of the book talking about how changing use framing from a social use to a medical one changes the drug by how we are processing it, how you can ingest it, and, and uh, what, what properties you want it to have. Um, it changes the setting in which you take it, um, and we also count age as a setting. Um, and then um, it also changes the mindset you may be in uh, that prompts use, or, um, and, and these are all important ingredients, and so keeping that distinct uh, has value. And so. you mentioned early when we started talking about policy, what do you think would be one or two messages a policy maker would take from your, your book? Well, that it looks a lot like other medicines, right? I mean, this kind of thing we've heard about, well, this was just a way to get a wedge so we can get full legalization, uh, is belied by the experience of these individuals. I mean, this is a legitimate medicine for them. It's extremely important to their well-being. And recognizing that and changing policy so that it reflects it and that we can have proper research into the possible applications, which are staggering. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do on that. Well, I also think um, some of the important things that you can learn from the book have to do with um, decision points. So, um, how uh, patients have a choice to use cannabis and they have a choice to join a state program. Those are two choices, not one. So, uh, what are the risks? What are the benefits? What are um, you know, what, what kind of calculation are you going to do as an individual? And likewise, uh, doctors face certain, um, you know, risks and, um, and so how are you going to have doctors be more informed and how do you control risks around what, what doctors face as well? So the, those are just, it, it's just important to unpack some of that stuff and not treat, not conflate it because um, if you're really gonna understand why people participate in those programs, you need to see that as a, a separable decision from deciding right. to use cannabis. And you had asked about our next projects. We're working on an article that's gonna address this policy question in terms of looking at the diversity of programs in the various states. And from a viewpoint of do they reflect an attitude that you know, cannabis use represents a medical necessity or does it represent a moral hazard? And the moral hazard approach says, well, let's treat it like alcohol, let's treat it like tobacco, where we need to do everything we can to create barriers to people using it. Well, acknowledge they're gonna use it, not treat them like criminals, but let's still make it difficult, make it expensive. Versus a medical necessity point of view, in which is like, no, we need to facilitate people's access to this, not create barriers to it. So why don't we end here? Um, I'm really grateful for you guys being willing to share the work you've done. I'm really excited about some of the future work. And I hope to keep in touch so we can keep the dis discussion going. And I hope this would be a requirement for all medical schools, especially the <laughs> training of physicians, <laughs> to provide them with more information. Uh, so this is Marty Otanias. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. See you next time.